colleague, uh, Jane Foster. Jane joins us from um, UT Southwestern Medical School in Dallas, uh, where she just joined, now professor of psychiatry at the Center for Depression Research and Clinical Care. She was in London. McMaster. McMaster, pardon me, in Hamilton before that. So she's a Canadian, but she's going back and forth now trying to get the lab set up. I know the pain because I'm doing the same thing between Toronto and Vancouver. Um, so I will stop there and let Jane take the podium and talk about novel approaches to identifying clinical links between our microbes and mental health. Thank you, Jane. Thanks very much. So thank you for, to the organizers for bringing me to Vancouver. I love to come here. Uh, my daughter actually lives here in Marple, so uh, it's always good to stop by and see her and to meet a lot of you. There's a few friendly uh, faces in the audience, but um, I'd like to suggest this is an idea talk embedded in a keynote. So I'm going to try to um, keep it interesting. I don't know how many people have heard all about. Am I doing something? <laughs> uh Okay, so I'm going to tell you, it's really my journey that I'm talking to you about, and it really takes it from early, I actually trained in uh, biochemistry of invertebrate systems, and recently have published, you know, on uh, human systems that, you know, translate some of the early findings in my lab um, uh, in mice. So this is fun for me. Uh, disclosures, just for uh, the record, funding and other um, things that I do. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about where we came from. So I'm quite sure everybody's heard about the microbiome by now, but not everybody quite has had the microbiota brain research uh, access. And we talk about the decade, but I've been doing this for about 15 years. Um, so I predate my own slides. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the key findings. There's been some real movement in the last couple of years tra translating preclinical findings into the clinic not just from the perspective of this looks like the mouse and this looks like the clinic, but actually starting to think about mechanisms. Uh, and then I'm gonna sort of postulate where it might land um, in the future uh, as an impact for precision medicine and psychiatry, potentially neurology, although I don't know much about neurology. So I'm gonna do the shtick about the microbes just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, Oh, so let's just, sh let's, I don't need to see anything other than, I don't believe there's any notes. If there is, I'll be a surprise. Okay, that should be good. Okay. Um, so there's microbes all over the surfaces of your body. And that's reflected in this upper right-hand picture here. I don't think we have a, 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 I guess you can't, maybe this works. Yeah, okay. Um, and so what this shows, this is from the Human Gut Project. And what it shows is that these are 300 individuals that they sampled bacteria all over the surfaces and then sequenced them. And so what it shows you is gut bacteria between individuals is more similar than my gut bacteria, my oral my microbiome, right? So there's individual and intra-individual differences. But what the most important take home there is these in this case, focused on bacteria, these are your own bacteria, your own microbiome, and they represent both an interaction between your genetics and your environment. So I like to think of it as a snapshot of your life history. So from a medical perspective, this is probably a pretty useful tool. And just on the numbers game, we have a hundred trillion gut bacteria. We have 1 trillion bacteria on our skin and 10 million bacteria in our mouth that are supposed to be there. These are not the ones the dentist is talking to you about. So in fact, your body is mostly microbes. And when we think about the biochemical capacity or the genetic makeup of these microbes, we have about 23,000 human genes and we have 2 million bacterial or viral genes in our guts. So um, they're essential to pathogen defense. They're important to nutrient uptake and metabolism. If you're a vegetarian, you wouldn't be able to digest all that dietary fiber without um, your microbes. Uh, they're essential for that gut barrier integrity, which is where a lot of this bottom-up inflammation um, might be important. They're essential to the immune system development. I'm going to talk a lot about this. And then they're also important to healthy brain development. And this has really emerged initially in preclinical studies, but moving into the mice. And again, as I say, I'm going to focus a little bit on the work we've been doing about microbe immune system um, impacts on the brain. So this is our gut-brain access, and this is just to make remind me that we know a lot about how microbes in the brain connect. Some of these are well-known mechanisms, and some of these are more general pathways. We don't know exactly how they work, 
but there's neural connections. The biggest one is the vagus nerve. It's a bi-directional nerve. So it can both go from the brain to the gut and the gut to the brain. But what this little window shows you in here is really where a lot of the action is happening. So we have our enteric nervous system that wraps our uh, gastrointestinal tract, which is right against the mucosal immune system, which is a very enriched mu uh, immune site. And then that barrier, which in this case, we're taking a little window uh, into a snippet of the colon, and on the other side, these trillions of bacteria, and it's this crosstalk between those microbes and that mucosal immune system that also have downstream impacts on your systemic immune system that are one of the key signaling um, pathways that influence the CNS. So this is the, this is the timeline, and I'm just going to pull out a couple of features from this timeline. Um, that I'm going to highlight to tell you this translational story. So the first thing is this 2004 paper, which happened about the time I set up my lab at McMaster, showed that these germ-free mice that are mice with no microbes in any way, shape, or form had an exaggerated stress response. So all of the microbiome brain research access came from two areas, neuroimmunology and stress biology, right? And it's because of the the enrichment in those fields that the microbiome actually has an ability to, or people who are studying the microbiome have an ability to bring things together. So key things were papers or work that came out of my lab and at about the same time out of Rochelle Diaz Heights's lab at the Karolinska that demonstrated that germ-free mice have an altered anxiety-like profile. And in fact, they have less anxiety than uh, mice that are, that are housed in conventional housing. Whether or not this is due to the microbes or due to the fact that they're skinny, scrawny, starving mice was up for debate, but Chemek Bursik and Steve Collins at McMaster showed about the same time that if you actually take the microbes or the, the fecal samples from a CD1 mouse, which is a gregarious mouse, I think it was actually Swiss Webster mice, and put it into a bulb C mouse, which has high anxiety, you can flip the phenotypes, suggesting in fact that the microbes are playing a role. Whether or not it has anything to do with human brain, was actually triggered about a couple of years later. And this was, you know, as, as most things are serendipitous. So Emmer and Mare and Kirsten Tillis at UCLA, they're gastroenterologists and they were giving probiotics to healthy women. And what they did is they imaged the women before and after 30 uh, days exposure to this cocktail of probiotics. And in doing so, they demonstrated that they could change resting state activity um, in healthy females. So this was sort of the first evidence, indirect as it may be, that in fact, these microbes are in fact affecting brain activity. And so since then, you can see on this slide, the little mice tell you the work that's been done preclinically, but in the past five years, this has all been translated into the clinic, initially starting with case control studies that say the composition is different, occasionally studies that say this is linked to a particular symptom, but as we move forward, we're getting better to sort of look at how can we generate potentially biomarkers using the microbiome to actually have a clinical impact, and that's the story I'm going to try to tell you. So this is also just at an indirect level, there's been a lot of work in germ-free mice, and it shows a lot of alterations, as we said, in the stress system, um, alterations in neuroprotection, neural function, physiology, and a whole host of behavioral phenotypes. But just to give you a little bit of evidence that it directly affects the brain in these mice as well, uh, my lab's been doing work using imaging, using behavioral tests, flow cytometry, a whole host of different tools. But this is some imaging work we did in collaboration with Jason Lurch uh, at SickKids and uh, Jacob Elgood. And in this case, they we used... Um, 7T. So this is post-mortem imaging, uh, structural imaging. Um, and you can see all the specs there because I'm quite sure there's more imaging specialists in the room than me. And then the uh, fly-through shows you on the left left-hand side, if we just look at absolute differences between males and females, wild type or conventionally housed in germ-free mice, you can see that as I said, they are starving mice. So they're, they're, there's a very small brain compared to the bigger brain of the uh, conventionally housed mice. But on the right hand side, when we start to look at relative volume differences, we actually see that it's not universal. So there are several brain regions that are smaller in germ-free mice from a relative abundance perspective and some that are larger. And these are captured again on the right hand side. This is just sort of proof of concept to show you these are adult mice, so you can look over the lifespan. But things like the cortex are bigger in uh, germ-free mice and some of the fiber tracks are smaller and certainly uh, the total brain volume is smaller. 
And if we want to know what the window of opportunity is or the window of interaction that might be important, there's a couple of different manipulations we can do. So one is we can actually um, colonize the, the mice with what's called the altered Shadler flora. This is about eight bacteria that we know reconstitute the immune system and everything else. So if you give those to germ-free mice prior to con conception, you're effectively have it getting a you know, compare, it's a historical germ-free mouse that now is, is fully uh, got all its microbes. And when we do that, and we look at these different um, things, we see that for the most case, that returns the mouse to normal brain volumes. Um, the other thing you can do is you can conventionalize the mice at different time windows. And over a host of different studies, we think that that first four weeks of life is the most important. And in this case, we conventionalize mice at five weeks of age, and we couldn't, um, you know, return any of the volumes back to normal. So effectively, we have a little window where we think that the microbes are most important to brain development in that postnatal window. Okay. So microbes communicate with the brain through, during all these pathways. And the one that I'm going to tell you about is the immune system. And so without your microbes, your immune system doesn't develop properly. And I'm going to show you a story that says without your immune system, your microbes don't develop properly. So we've been using these T cell receptor knockout mice. And so T cell receptors come in two flavors, alpha beta, which is your common T cell receptor that does most of the work for your immune system and gamma deltas, which are less frequent, but do a host of interesting things as well. In this case, these mice are missing both the beta and the delta receptor. So those T, uh, progenitors for mature T cells get stuck in the thymus. So these mice have no functional T cells and they're different from skid mice or rag knockout mice because those genes are all expressed in the brain. So these are sort of a postnatal wipeout of T cells. And we've done a whole host of uh, studies on these mice, which are all published. Um, and they're just listed here as we see very differences in behavior. And at some point we move from adult behaviors into neurodevelopmental and we see things like motor delays, we see exaggerated stress, we see um, reduced anxiety-like behavior, and we see a lot of sex differences um, in, these, in these mice. And we think that T cells are actually part of the system that is important in wiring those stress differences in the brain. So when we think about development, which is where we're going we're gonna to start today, is we think about the fact that these microbes are actually, you're exposed as you go down the vaginal tract, you get these my microbes that you gobble up and that is seeds your system for developing its own microbiome. If you're born by C-section, you get those first microbiome from the room or from the breast. And so there's a whole host of uh, factors that can influence your colonization of your microbiome in the first place. And in humans and in mice and in other systems, that early life exposure actually can change your risk factors for a whole host of diseases. And that's shown in the upper right-hand corner of this panel, showing that you know, while your microbiome uh, maturation and colonization is happening in parallel with the development of your, your, your neurons, and we know from a lot of work in human brain development that in that first year of life, this happens sequentially, right? We don't wire all the systems at the same time. So in the upper left, that's the, the, the order of operations. And so... What's interesting from my perspective is all these things are happening at the same time. We have this sequential development of the brain. We have this colonization and maturation of the uh, microbiome. And then in addition to that, we have the adaptive immune system that develops at the same time. So this is just to translate that picture of um, brain development in a human to a mouse. So we can actually map Brain, human brain development to the same milestones in a mouse. The timing is different, but we line these up and this is how we design the behavioral pi uh, pipeline that we use. And we design some of the interventions or places we look at uh, microbe immune brain. Um, and just for the purposes of what we've been doing is we're most interested in the T cell and it actually also develops uh, postnatally. So those first three weeks of life the T cell is emerging, and we think the crosstalk between the microbe and the, the immune system, particularly the T cell, if you know any of the work of Joni Kipnis, who has shown how these T cells get into the meninges and really influence through cytokine production, development of microglia and other uh, pruning events. We think this is all going on, and we think that it's important. Okay, 
So some data. So in this case here, we're looking at T-cell deficient mice, these double knockout mice versus black six mice, which are the wild type controls. And at this point, we're looking at postnatal day 24, which in a mouse is post weaning. So most of the systems have developed at this point. And there's two figures here. Um, in all these figures, you'll see males and females. We don't see a lot of sex differences at some of these low resolution measures. But this is looking at black six versus T-cell uh, deficient mice. And we see this reduced um, Shannon index, which is a measure of alpha diversity, which is a within subject measure. So it's how rich are your microbes. And we also see a beta diversity on the right. So this uh, PCA plot shows, takes into a consideration both the abundance of the taxa, but also the number of taxa are there. So it's a good re reflection of both abundance and composition. And so as in that first plot I showed on the human microbiome, the composition and the profile of, of bacteria in a T cell division mouse is completely different than a wild type mouse. And if we look at those differences, which we can do by using uh, sequencing tools, this shows at the, um, when you use a sequence, when you sequence the 16S ribosomal RNA uh, gene, which is specific to bacteria, you get um, these amplicon sequence variants that are distinct and possibly sometimes shared uh, sequences for different taxa. And so this just shows um, a series of those uh, taxa that are more abundant in wild type mice, which are on the left-hand side of this graph, or more abundant in T cell deficient mice on the right-hand side. And the details of this aren't important at this point, but it just shows you that these tools can actually distinguish at a, at a very low re high resolution, different tax that might be contributing to the communication between um, TCR and uh, black six mice. But the interesting thing about it is there's some that are completely absent in wild type mice and some that are completely absent in T cell deficient mice. So just like the germ-free mice, these are not necessarily mechanistic <laughs> Um, points, but they point to something that says this might be a place to look. So a lot of this work has laid the groundwork for what people are now doing in clinical populations. And one of the things that we did is we wanted to actually look at how does this develop. So we see this low um, alpha diversity, but is it there right from the get-go? Is it, is, it, is it part of what's happening? And so in this case, we just looked at the same outcomes in a different cohort of mice at postnatal day 17. This is pre-weaning postnatal day 24 post weaning, and then a few days later, and then in adulthood. And what you can see in these uh, alpha diversity plots in panel A is that in fact, we see that lower diversity in the second cohort in those T cell deficient mice, but early in life, we see actually their trajectory is faster. So it seems that the microbiome diversity happens faster. So they're missing a cue from the T cell to slow down or they're just accelerating and then they level out so that you know early in life they sort of have an enriched diversity but then it just stays there the other thing you know if you look at the 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 right hand graph is in a wild type normal mouse there's a big shift between pre weaning and post weaning of this bacterial taxa so at postnatal day 17 the taxa is yet is still on the on the diet of the the, of of the, the the dam, but also there's a whole host of other things that are developing at that last part of that third week of life, and then it gets shifted into what looks more like an adult. This is very comparable to what happens in in kids. It's around two to three years of age that these these um, taxa start to look even like adult taxa, and the systems are in place. So that window of sort of uh, vulnerability to things like autoimmunity, to allergies, to asthma, that all happens in that first 12 to 14 months. But by three years to four years of age, it's sort of consolidating what these systems look like. So I think we've recapitulated a lot of that here in the mice. So we think that we have something that we can um, leverage to look at the same systems in people. Okay. So the last wrinkle in the mouse data I want to share with you is the fact that who's there is not as important as what they might be doing. Right. So this is the thing about the microbiome. There's a lot of papers out there saying taxa A, taxa B, taxa C. They're, this is a community of bacteria and they have functions. So in this same cohort that I just showed you, what we did is we took both uh, uh, fecal, cecal, 
tissue samples from the gut and the brain to look at the metabolome. So that's like, what are the changes in the metabolites that we might be able to start to understand what the might pathway might, might be, which we think is a microbe to metabolite to immune to brain. And so here's a sample of the data. This paper, these papers were just published at the end of last year. Um, so this is looking at a spectrogram from the uh, uh, spectroscopy that looks at the differential expression of metabolites between T cell deficient mice and black six mice, the same comparison throughout. And anything that's above the, the midline is there's a greater level of that metabolite in the T cell deficient mice. Anything below the, men, the midline is reduced. And what's notable in the sequel sample, so that's you know sort of representative of what's going on in the in the mouse, which is not the same as the fecal sample, which is what we throw out, although it looks very comparable. And what we see is we see this elevate of this five amino pentanoate, which often is also re uh, referred to as five five amino valerate. But it's an it's a lysine degradation pathway that seems to be upregulated in the absence of T cells. So what happens is you take away the T cells, you take away a signal, and somehow the the the, the function of the microbiome shifts, which it might be the way it functions in a low diverse situation. The other thing that's notable is this butyrate, which is a short chain fatty acid that is produced by microbes by uh, fermenting dietary fiber. It's what we require our microbes to do for us is reduced in these mice. So again, we see this phenotype that might be comparable to a whole host of sort of low functioning gut situations in human conditions. And then finally, when we look at the colon, which is the tissue around, the, around the, the thing, we see host differences as well. In this case, we see upregulation on the host side of the same pathway that we saw upregulated in the microbes. So we need to consider both the host and the microbes if we're going to understand the impact um, mechanistically. And then just to, you know, confirm that these associations that we're talking about are a little bit uh, are more relevant, we used um, Diablo, which is a, a supervised classification algorithm to link the microbes to the uh, metabolites. And you can see the loading plots um, on the upper right, which just highlight some of these microbes and some of these metabolites. And then in the bottom, we just show that over the lifespan in these mice, these differences that we see of these microbe metabolite associations are pretty strong in the data. So this sort of shows us that we've identified this microbe metabolite signature that might actually be operational in some of the differences we see in these T cell deficient mice. And more importantly, I guess, for the brain crowd, right? I was saying uh, to Randy earlier, I, my, last few, my last few meetings have been very microbiome oriented. So, you know, it's nice to be back in a neuroscience context where, where I think I live, but I think maybe I might be becoming a microbiologist. Um, we also looked at changes in the brain. And so this is just, again, one example. Uh, this is a fairly low powered study for, for this type of work, but this is one example of a spectrogram in the cortex to show that we are detecting all of the right metabolites. And then this is a bit of a summary of some of the changes over, over the, the, the P24 to P82 window. Um, and we see changes across the brain um, in a host of different uh, metabolites. Um, interestingly enough, that the, the, the most robust difference that was uh, reproducible across the age was an increase in GABA and an increase of acetate. So again, these are signaling cascades that a whole host of studies have suggested are impacted by this microbiota brain axis and understanding the mechanism of how that happened might actually um, be helpful for understanding heterogeneity and psychiatric illnesses if these are contributing. So we also see a changes in, in micro, microbiota composition that are similarly, we can link to some of the observations we see. And then I've already told you about the changes in the metabolites. So this is just the shift. So we've done a lot of work in these, in these T cell deficient mice. And if you map some of these changes in the T cell deficient mice, the goal and the part of the reason I moved to UT Southwestern is I have an opportunity now to investigate these same changes in a clinical population, in this case, related to depression. So the biggest challenge in psychiatry, as some people in the room might be aware, is that we have this group of individuals who show up in the doctor's office, and there's no way to distinguish whether or not they're going to respond to a first-line antidepressant, CBT, 
neurostimulation. And in fact, we have no idea how to land them into cohorts. Although there's been some success, successes, you know, we have some local success with EEG sorting, you know, predicting outcome to antidepressants. Um, and so the, the goal of the work, all of the biomarker work doing, we're doing in psychiatry is really to get out of the game of diagnostics and get into the game of predictive uh, outcomes using biology. And as I said earlier, your microbiome is actually that intersection between your own genetics and your environment and your life history to date. So theoretically, it should be a good marker. Uh, and this is just to remind, which I've already said, which is what I do. I just you know make sure that I remember why I'm why I'm here. Um, so we have all of these intra-individual and inter-individual um, aspects of your microbiome. And so if you take these into account, it's possible that we can leverage these in combination with potentially imaging signatures or lifestyle situations, or maybe societal issues to help uh, explain the, the clinical heterogeneity. I've been reminded by a couple of psychiatrists, we don't want to get rid of the heterogeneity. We want to understand it right? Because the heterogeneity exists. We don't only want to be able to treat the one group that fits into SSRI responsive. Okay. So there's a whole bunch of benefits for uh, microbe immune biomarkers in psychiatry. As I've probably already said, microbiome is our own, but these biomarkers have many pot potential purposes. One is to subgroup clinical populations. That's mostly what I'm thinking about in my own work, but we're also just to screen individuals for micro post or microbe drug interactions. As you saw in that mouse example, there are systems where both the microbe system and the host system is impacted at the same time. And there's a lot of good examples of that in the literature where, for example, whether or not you're gonna be able to, a good metabolizer, acetaminophen, depends on P. Cressel levels in your gut because those microbes interfere with the metabolism of acetaminophen. So these drug interactions are real. There was a great paper about three or four years ago that looked at a thousand different drugs and about 300 of them affect the growth of individual bacteria across the spectrum of microbes. Included in there were some uh, psych psychiatric active drugs, right? So people are very interested in this. In our own work, we've actually taken aripiprazole and escitalopram, fed it to uh, cultures of people's fecal samples, human human stool samples, and shown that aripiprazole is metabolized only by a subset of people's microbes, right? So some people can metabolize it, some people can't. So this whole concept of side effects or drug-drug interactions has a lot of potential in the microbiome. Um, there's a huge potential, as I shown in, showed in mice, the, that early life period seems to be the window where these are most operative. And then we sort of land in a more stable configuration for the rest of our life. So potentially at risk youth, we might be able to use biomarkers related to microbe immune to know when to intervene or, you know, best strategies for that. There's a lot of microbiome targeted therapies on the, on the market. I'm sure people have heard about some of the successes with uh, fecal uh, micro, microbiota transplantation. This is a very hot topic not a part of my talk, but, you know, a good conversation starter if we were in the idea section of the day. Uh, and then there's a lot of diet, prebiotic, probiotic, and other interventions. And these have been very um, effective. And there's a lot of attention moving into nutritional psychiatry and taking a little bit more of a holistic view, both from a, a clinical perspective, but also from a research design perspective. Okay. So as said, a year ago, almost exactly, uh, Foster Lab 1.0 moved to Dallas, Texas, bit of a trauma. Um, and I'm going to tell you about the reason I moved there in, in, a, in a story of a paper that just came out, um, which is a cohort study that is, looks uh, naturalistically at two groups of people. Uh, the Dallas 2K study that looks at people who have either been diagnosed with depression currently or historically, and the RAD study, which is a resilience in adolescent depression study, which uh, tracks people who are at risk. And this is looking longitudinally. They come in every six months, they give stool, blood, all of the whole things. They do imaging, they do EEG. Um, so this is the big cohort. And I've been working with uh, Dr. Trevetti and his group for about, well, he was a, he's been an advisor to the Canbind group in Canada for about 10 years, but him and I have been working together about five years. And I'm going to tell you about this paper we just published, which effectively does translate all the story I've told you into the clinical population and puts us in a position to dig into those mechanisms that um, are interesting in this microbe immune section. So it was just came out in translational psychiatry literally on the 30th of April. And it's looking using, again, 16S uh, 
ribosomal RNA gene sequencing to um, phenotype the microbiome. And we used clinical symptoms representing anhedonia, which was measured with the DARS, depression, which was measured with self-report, which is the PHQ-9, and anxiety, which was measured with GADS-7. And you can see the population here. It's 178 people um, currently or with a history of depression. So this is a very naturalistic study. And I've, I've just laid out the key points here. And these are the key points, hopefully interesting analytically to people, but they're a little bit novel in the way people approach the microbiome. So as I say, there's been a lot of case control studies. What we did and what I pressed Sarah Asbury, who was the primary person who did all these analytics, was to think a little bit more about the community structure. We need to know about the ecology. We also need to get into the upper GI and think about what's happening because that's where a lot of the, the impact may be happen. But what we did here is we borrowed applied weight weighted gene correlation analysis from the transcriptomic people because you know we have all of these different ASVs that we can generate out of the sequencing data and we use that uh, correlation weighted gene correlation analysis and we identified these three community stable community structures and so there's a lot more detail in the paper about the stability of these things but you can see them there there's a brown the blue and the turquoise modules so this allows you using that gene expression tool to export a individual microbiome signature for each in, each individuals for these three everybody has these three communities but you can effectively get three representative representative numbers which we refer to as eigentaxa instead of eigengenes out of that data and that allows you to then take that and say how is that person's microbiome one number associated with their clinical phenotype it also allows you to identify hub taxa which you can see in the bottom left-hand corner. And it shows you these hub tacks are the ones most connected with other ones. And in the right-hand side, I just highlight three of the hub tacks from these networks. These are density plots, which show you that in some cases, as in the first two here, they're relatively abundant and well distributed through your community. So they're not rare taxa that are driving the outcomes. The third one is a little bit less abundant. So it might represent a smaller um, community of individuals. Um, and when we took that eigentaxa and we looked at associations, which we did for all three modules, that brown um, uh, module or net network of bacteria was associated with um, anhedonia, depression, and anxiety at a low level. Can't see, so I have to do this. And then what I did here is just, again, take us through the analytics because I think it's what's important of how this is done. And so you can, you can, then take this inf information and you can look at things like module membership. So module membership is again, a number that you can pet and in all these graphs below, it's on the, it's on the X axis and it is correlating tax abundance with the eigentaxa of that individual. So it's, it allows you to get this sort of how abundant is that taxa in this individual's microbiome. And then you can associate that with their clinical phenotype, which is on the Y axis. And what I've highlighted is the three, the red, the blue and the green um, taxa are those hub taxa. So this is suggesting through these additional analytical approaches that these taxa are actually driving the phenotype that we see. And we can also do things like taxa significance where we get a um, signed uh, Pearson correlation between those. And we can also look at classical uh, associations. And when we do that, what we find is this brown module is robustly associated with the anxiety phenotype of course, this is anxiety phenotype at the time the microbiome sample was taken across this cohort, and that these hub taxa that we identified are strongly associated with anxiety. So what's interesting about these hub taxa, which I think is on this final slide here, is that what's enriched in them is a reduction in those butyrate producing taxa that I told you earlier were important in that T cell mouse model. So butyrate is, again, this short chain fatty acid, it's essential to barrier integrity. There's a lot of clinical conditions where it's reduced and it's representative of sort of a low microbiome functioning, but it's also something that can be replaced. So for example, you can feed butyrate to mice and fix a lot of their problems. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a clinically targetable pathway. Um, and uh, it's also during development, one of the key players that's important for, for uh, regulating your immune system development, but also in adult systems, 
it's the key factor that helps monitor or keep in balance those T regulatory cells, which are sort of protective T cells. So it sort of sits in the same panel that the depletion in this high anxiety phenotype is related to these microbe immune pathways that we think are important to anxiety uh, preclinically. Um, so I think that that's what, I, I think I said everything that's on that slide. Um, and so where to next? So this is, this is the, the concept of where this is all coming from, right? So if we have this clinical problem, population and some healthy controls, if we leverage something like the microbiome that I told you uh, today, combine potential with other tools in the room, in this case, uh, imaging, and you know, it's important to have both the who is there and the what are they doing on the microbiome and the host side, um, that we might be able to create these algorithms that better subtype people, and that allows us to predict um, how we might respond uh, in certain clinical outcomes. So most of the work that we saw here was done by the slowly depleted group of uh, investigators uh, at McMaster and um, the more cl recent clinical work done in collaboration with uh, Maduker and some of the other scientists at UT Southwestern. So happy to take questions if we have time. Wonderful. Um, so time for questions. Um, I have one question to start with, um, since I have okay. uh, You mentioned um, that um, you could um, use the, the configuration of the microbiome to help decide whether someone's going to respond to a drug or whether it's metabolizing. Can you also use it to, to identify toxicity? Yeah, so there's, there's some good examples of both of those. So... Um, in cancer immunotherapy, they've identified for people who respond to a particular drug for glioblastoma that it's linked to their microbiome. And they went so far as to take the microbiome of the people who respond and give it to non-responders and the, uh, another half responded. So that's one direction. In autism, it, is, it appears that some of the phenotype of the microbe change actually is producing more phenolytic, phenolytic and toxic compounds. And so um, that's work coming out of Sarkis Masmanian's lab. And they've demonstrated that from a mouse model into humans, and also then used what looks like an absorb GI absorbent in the kids in a proof of concept to reduce those toxic compounds and then have a benefit. So both, uh, both, both can happen, that you could have more of a protective molecule or more of a de detrimental. And one of the things we'd like to do, we think we've actually, in our um, cohort, that association is actually a negative association. Those, the people with high anxiety have a depleted system, which might suggest you could take it a different way around and say, if you have more of this, you have less anxiety. So it's just a matter of directionality. Right, great. Great, Hi, thank you, that was great. Um, so I, I'm a psychologist and I, I wondered about whether you could work in teams, you know, like the uh, people who do the research you do, psychologists who study behavior and know their patients really well in terms of how they behave and, and the reports that they have about their symptoms, and psychiatrists who know um, drugs really well. Could there be more of, of that kind of team approach? Um, so that you've described what the Center for Depression Research and Clinical Care at UT Southwestern is. There's 95 of us. Oh, okay. Seven faculty, including clinical psychologists, about 30 coordinators, and a whole bunch of outreach. Um, so that's the reason I moved to UT Southwestern is that's exactly what they're doing, right, um, right from the 10-year-olds right to the 70-year-olds. And is it? Is and there's it, there's other groups in the that are doing. I mean, I think that team science approach to these things is. I mean, the Cambine Depression Network does that less with psychologists, but still comprehensive. I guess no, there's true. Lena's there. There's Kate there. Um, yeah. So there's quite a few big networks that are doing this work. I think what, what the next wave is actually doing the trials that demonstrate these have validity in a clinical context, right? This is the, the we've done a lot of discovery in biomarker work. Now it's time to demonstrate that it has a clinical impact. So that's the next step. Yeah. Great. Uh, hi, thanks so much for the talk. This is really interesting. And uh, I noticed um, I'm a brain person. So I was staring at the brains of your mice. Uh, 
And I noticed that uh, I think those were volumetric measurements. So the, the ones with the T cell deficient cells, um, they had greater cerebral cortex. Uh, so presumably thickened and more volume than cerebral cortex, but then the decrements in, in tissue seem to be more limbic and more subcortical. Yep. Uh, that's just my superficial read of the, the mice brain. So I'm just curious if there has, have been any studies that you know of in humans that have compared groups with low diversity and high diversity of uh, um, the microbiota. Uh, that might then correlate with structural changes of uh, density or functional changes that are somehow that are parallel in terms of cortical versus subcortical um, uh, dissociations, the way you see in the mice. So in both, we've also done similar work in the T cell deficient mice, and there are sex differences both in both the germ-free and that from that perspective. So in the in both those situations, there's amygdala differences that are classical anxiety phenotypes in females, and more um, RAFE based differences in some of the mice. But the best clinical study came from the the paper I highlighted from 2013. The follow up to that was uh, I think that um, Emerin and Kirsten did a similar study with. Uh, a cohort, again, healthy women, where they gave this probiotic for an extended period of time, and they did all the domains of Im imaging before and after. And they did it at a time where the world was starting to sort, and then they did the microbiome sequencing on all those individuals as well, instead of just an indirect measure, which was probiotic, yes or no. Um, and they looked at the compositional networks in those individuals, and they identified the work, the, what they, what the, field refers to as enterotypes, which are sort of community bit similar to our communities, but they're at a little bit lower resolution of different types of communities of bacteria. And then they mapped that onto functional changes in the CNS using DTI, fMRI, and resting state. And they showed that people had a more like a vegetarian diet had better aspects in some of the reactive or had, I can't remember exactly what the story was, but had some changes that were associated with you know, better integrity in some systems, but we're more reactive to stress. So they, that's the one study. It's a little bit old. So, um, so I'm sure they have other stuff in the pipe that I'm not sure I've seen. But yeah, there has been some of these associations where people have built off of that template of what I've put out there and started to look a little bit um, more difficultly. One of the big dif difficulties early days in this was that the compositional nature of the microbiome, the tools have only just been developing in the last five years to take into account the compositional nature. So feature selection is a little bit easier because you can think about how to reduce the, the rare and the, and the um, most abundant ones to not bias your analytics, similar to the way you have to take into account it from uh, imaging. You know, how do you do dimension reduction in imaging, it's it's it. Those choices make a difference. We've done a little bit of look in the my in the cohort that I have that 178. I have imaging on those, so we have taken a little bit of a look in that. But I think we might need better resolution sequencing of the microbiome to get the right features to look at. One of the things we did see in association was a thing that's called volatility, where we had two measures in an individual, because how stable is your microbiome? over time might relate to some of the functional changes you might expect at the CNS. And we did see some preliminary associations there, but nothing to put in a paper yet. That's really interesting. Yeah. Thank you. We got Other questions on the Zoom, actually. Yes, how are you doing? Yes, we have a question from Kate and Kelly on Zoom. Uh, she wants to know, does taking pre and probiotics increase the effectiveness of antidepressant medications by helping those individuals metabolize them better? Um, there is some some evidence, but I don't know that for SSRIs are on the list of that are affected by um, metabolisms. Some of the uh, tricyclics are on the list. Um, there is some evidence of augmentation. Uh, similar, it might operate similarly if you improve the diet of somebody while they're on an SSRI. So it could be um, supporting the same path. The the microbes definitely influence things like tryptophan metabolism, both locally in the gut and potentially pathways that might be anti-inflammatory, right? Some SSRIs have anti-inflammatory pathways. So it could be a boost to that. It depends. There's great work coming out of um, uh, Justin so Sonnenberg's lab this year, which showed it matters who's there when you start. So you give fermented foods to a lot of people, they can all benefit. You give them dietary fiber. If they don't have the microbes that can respond to the dietary fiber, 
then they're not necessarily going to do as well. So then that's where people are saying, give the fiber and the probiotic, right? So this sort of more holistic approach across uh, disciplines is a, is exactly where the field is going. I think that's really exciting to, we might need some dietitians on the team um, that you're of the, the big networks, right? A little bit more about the benefits, yeah. Hi, thanks so much. Um, I'm wondering if you discussed the bi-directional crosstalk between the immune and the microbiome. I'm wondering if you've seen anything uh, similar between like the neural and microbiome, as in like your uh, bit about depression, does treating depression then influence uh, the content of the microbiome or is it kind of only one way? So there is, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a chicken and the egg. I can see where you're going here. So um, certainly stress influences your microbiome. So the stress is on board first, it can affect the microbiome. So elevated court and things like that, either you know through external stresses um, can impact the microbiome. Um, the microbiome is, is, as I say, it's biochemical capacity is great. What's difficult is mapping that any metabolite that might, or metabol met metabolic change that comes from the microbiome through the pathway to the CNS. First of all, in mice, it's tough enough, but in people, it's even, it's even tougher. Um, so I think that there's both uh, top down and bottom up. And so if it's top down, maybe it affects that barrier integrity, and then there's a downstream cons consequence potentially on uh, inflammation, right? Like a lot of uh, conditions have a high level of inflammatory tone. And so these systems, you know, might be part of that balance. Hey, um, I have two questions, but they're kind of connected. So I will just ask them together. Uh, so as I understood that the postnatal uh, development phase is most important part for my uh, gut brain access. Uh, is there any way that we can increase the exposure to uh, good bacteria, let's say, in microbiome that will um, benefit the postnatal development for brain? And if there is, uh, do you think that could be used for preventive medicine for hereditary uh, psychiatric illnesses? So yes, um, definitely uh, that overview slide showing what matters early um, is, uh, you know, mode of delivery. It's definitely, you know, has an impact. There's not long-term impacts on the microbiome itself from a C-section versus a vaginal birth. Breastfeeding, you know, there's all these great uh, poly uh, oligosaccharides that are in breast milk that, you know, the companies have tried to mimic, but they really can't do it as well as, as, as uh, breast milk does, and that feeds the microbiome. There's key microbes in breast milk that feed the baby's microbiome. So there's, the, you know, one of the things that people look at in that first year of life is new bacteria when they hit. And so there's a whole host of bacteria that appear just about the time babies get that stranger response, right? So there's a lot of interest in that maternal health. So certainly improving maternal health pre pregnancy and during pregnancy and postpartum really would have a big impact on the transfer of the, the microbiome, right? Keeping the moms healthy. It's going to keep the babies healthy in that, that perspective. Um, allergy wise, there's been a lot of work suggesting that there's windows of opportunity in early life for, to improve allergy outcome by uh, intervening with microbiome based therapies, certainly preterm babies, you know, there's a lot of work showing that, you know, giving them the right consortium of bacteria can prevent some of the expected negative consequences of preterm birth. So there's a lot of movement in that space. And even just in adolescence, I mean, you know, eat right and exercise, you know, there's no better, you know, advice, but you know, what else is the, the details there? How can we convince people, right? That's part of the challenge. Uh, thanks again, James. Great, great start for the meeting. 